Anybody here for the first time? Awesome. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, and I appreciate everybody here because, you know, with the weather and the Republican National Convention, there's a lot of competition for our meeting. Um, so we're just glad that you came out to uh, hear this, the awesome speakers and to uh, attend our tea party. Um, I just want to let you know the, uh, we're a grassroots movement. We're not trying to form a third party. We're not endorsing candidates. And we have no party affiliation, in case you want to know that. But our goal is to educate, inform, and motivate, like it says on our sign, the citizens of Pickens County. Um, we all need to know what's going on so we can make uh, educated decisions uh, when it comes to um, choosing political leaders and, and uh, calling them on issues that are up before the legislature. Uh, and we're talking about at the national, local, and state level. You know, we're trying to be watchdogs on all levels of government. So, um, you know, thank you for coming. And in case you want to know what do we believe in, well, our mission is to educate, inform, and motivate, but our four core values are uh, that we believe in the Constitution. It's our foundation. You ever heard a wise man built his house upon a rock? Well, um, we believe our rock is, uh, of course, God, but um, the Constitution is the rock of the, um, the founding of our, um, our government. And uh, what's happening nowadays is we're drifting away from the Constitution. So we firmly believe in upholding the Constitution. Uh, we believe in fiscal responsibility. Um, we believe in limited government. We believe in free markets. Uh, we believe the highest level of prosperity occurs when there's a free market economy. And another thing that we really believe in is to protect our religious liberties. We believe in God and that we believe we have the right to express that belief. And the, um, there is a video out that um, the Catholics have put out and it's phenomenal. And it's encouraging people to vote values. And um, at the very beginning, you might not be able to read what it says, I'll just say it real quick. It says, in generations, generations past, the church has always been able to count on the faithful to take a stand to protect her sacred rights. This generation of believers must do the same. Now, I believe that our sheriff here in Pickens County is an incredibly righteous and moral person, and I'm real excited that we have someone like Donnie Craig to represent us and um, to be that light to uh, all the citizens. And, Every day I, uh, during school, I am able to go to the schools and I see the deputies directing traffic and interacting with the kids. And it's just a reflection of the awesome leadership we have uh, from our sheriff. And um, Bert Hoffman is here to share a few words of um, something, a fantastic idea that he had. And uh, we want to get behind him and help him. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, I'm Bert Hoffman, and I. Uh, I had an idea uh, about something to do, and as, as Susan said, you know, the federal government is not following the Constitution. We're trying to get them to do that, but that just doesn't seem to be working. I even ran for office to try to get myself there to set them right. Luckily, Tom Graves is there. He's doing a good job. But it just doesn't appear to me that that's where it's going to come from. So I looked at the state level and said, well, what can I do about this? And I read a little bit. And there's something called the Kentucky Resolution. It's where John Adams, back in the old days, our second president, had the sedition which said he put people in jail for saying things that he didn't like. And so the Kentucky Resolution by Madison and Jefferson said, well, you know, we get to decide what is a constitutional law through nullification. And if we don't like it, then Madison said, well, we interpose the state government between the federal government and our citizens. And, and that's what this, uh, this was about. And I even started a web page to try to get our uh, state legislators to be more conservative, so I left the right candidate. And actually, I'm going to talk about this uh, next month. But it, um, it's, it's, to, it's to grade our uh, senators and congressmen. Uh, Rick Jaspers does a good job, and so does Steve Gooch. So does our other senator here. So I'm, I'm well, pleased to say we have good people here. And, and then I went to a meeting uh, with Richard Mack, Sheriff Mack, who uh, had an interesting idea. And uh, it was during the Brady Bill. And they came in and said, you're going to have to enforce this bill for us. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. And so they went through the court system. And it was upheld that the sheriff, who is the highest elected officer, police officer, country, actually the only elected 
police officer in the country, um, uh, has the ability to, to determine what is constitutional or what is not because he takes an oath to uphold the United States Constitution. And this is what Sheriff Mack came out. He developed an organization, and you know, this handout is about that organization, the Constitutional the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association of the National Convention. I joined their posse and I got their emails and there was a uh, email that came in that this paper has it, that you see here too. And so they were having a meeting of this organization and that uh, for $299 you can uh, help send one of your uh, peace officers there. I said, that's a good idea. I think I'll send my own rather than giving them the money. So I went and talked to uh, Don Craig and Sheriff Craig, right? and he was very aware of this. And he uh, said he was thinking of going, and I said, well, you let me know, and I'm going to go ahead and you know, sponsor that $299 for you. He said he is going, so I thought, well, I better come on down here and see if y'all can help me on this expense. So uh, that's what I'm here, and, um, and uh, I, I'm very excited and pleased that we do have a sheriff of his uh, capacity. And I asked him uh, if there's anything he wanted me to convey to you. And he said, yeah, I just tell him I'm excited about going to this meeting and seeing what they have to say. And he uh, said also, it would be up to the board, I'd be willing to come over and talk a little bit about what that meeting was about. Um, and also, Sheriff Nicholson from Kingdom <coughs> County will be attending with me. So, I would appreciate it if y'all could help me. There is a uh, little box outside, and if you could put a check in. If you, uh, these are sitting around. On, if you look at the bottom, it tells you to make the check payable to, and then say um, uh, CSPOA office in the memo line, so that it'll be there. And he believes this is tax deductible. I'm not 100 percent sure. And if you just put some cash in, that that's fine too. And as soon as people are counted up, then I'll take that over to him as well. Thank you very much. So what we have here tonight is Chief Judge Brenda Weaver from the Superior Court Appalachian District will speak with us for about 15 minutes. That's what I'd like to allow all of you. And then uh, after her will be Charlie Bethel, who is a candidate for the Georgia House Senate District 54. Now he's on the west side of Pickens, that way, which includes Murray, Whitfield, parts of Catoosa, Gordon County. I believe I'm right on that, hopefully. So he is our representative that will be on our November ballot. Also, we have candidate Rick Jaspers, and he is with the Georgia House Representative District 12. He is lucky to have all of Pickens County. He's not split at all. We got through all of ourselves, so that's good. But he also has parts of Gordon and Bartow counties. And all these um, candidates here are unopposed and will be on your November ballot. So we'll have them. 15 minute increments, so watch your clock. And if I stand up, then that's it towards the end of your time. Then after that, we have Nelson Manor and Bob Burton, who are local Tea Party people. These are actual, uh, not professional speakers, but they're so enthusiastic about the Agenda 21, and they have a video, and it's regarding your property rights, which is what United Nations Agenda 21 is all about. That's just a tidbit. We've got a whole thing of it, but they like to update on it. They'll be talking to us around 8 o'clock, and they'll have a video and talk and some audience questions. So I think we will start with Brenda. I asked Kathy what she wanted me to talk about tonight. She said I could talk about anything that I wanted to, so I wanted to talk about uh, two things that are dear to my heart. That being the uh, felony drug court and the mental health court. She is handing out a document of our statistics that go through July of this year. We just recently had a uh, graduation and had several of our individuals to graduate. Many of you are aware, and certainly Representative Jasper was a very big part of this, Last year, uh, through the efforts of Governor Deal, Speaker of the House, David Ralston, and Chief Justice Carol Hunstein, a bill was passed, uh, House Bill 1176, which basically put over $11 uh, million dollars into felony drug courts and mental health courts. And you ask yourself, why? Well, a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons being that in Georgia, we have around 58,000 individuals in the prison system. And that is a lot of people. Uh, we're probably one of the top four throughout the country. Many of those individuals who are in our prison system are there as a result of addictions, uh, uh, 
uh, to illegal drugs or even prescription drugs, and some are in, in jail as a result of illnesses related to uh, mental problems. So years and years ago, uh, and I served in 2010, we actually started our first drug court. You say, what is drug court and what does it do? Well, first of all, drug court is not for everyone. You're not going to have someone in drug court who has been charged with or convicted, or convicted of child molestation or armed robbery or murder, or any of the violent crimes, things of that nature. What you will see individuals in drug court as a result of drug offenses or even property crimes such as burglary, theft, things of that nature. Now, initially, you would want to say, you would say, well, what does burglary have to do with drug addictions? Some of you, I uh, see that you're sort of doing this and you understand that once an addiction becomes very strong, that individuals will do a lot of things, including breaking into your home or stealing your car and doing some of those things in order to, to get the drug. And, and I see some of you are going, well, they need to be in prison. Well, maybe. But sometimes we're talking about individuals, both men and women, who are 18 years of age, uh, uh, going all the way up to 60, and maybe this is the first time they've ever been in trouble, or all of this started from an addiction problem. So what does drug court do? Drug court is a 24-month program, sometimes longer, in which an individual comes to court for a review twice a month. They are drug screened no less than twice per week, and usually more, and the more they are randomly tested at home or we go to the work sites. We have compliance officers who go out and check on them at work, at night, and on the weekends to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're in treatment classes three nights a week, and then they're also required to attend uh, three NA or A classes once a week. Uh, they must also have a job. If they do not have a high school diploma, they're required to start working on their GED. Uh, some of the things that you will notice, not only are they getting their GED, but we've had several of our drug court individuals to actually start college during the time in the drug court program. If they have children, they're required to pay for child support and be self-supporting. In other words, rather than us supporting them in the state prison system, they are paying the taxes, they are taking care of their children, and they're being monitored to make sure they're not committing other acts. Usually, in looking at drug court, the state prison, the, 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 the cost per day averages, I don't know, Rick, you may know this better than me at this point in time, it's anywhere from $25 to $50 per day. You multiply that by $365 and you can see per inmate times $58,000. That is a lot of money that they're spending. Now, what we are wanting to do is to make sure that these individuals are compliant and that, that you and your property is being kept safe. We uh, monitor them to make sure that they're not committing new additional crimes, and we, it's extremely important to us that they do everything that they are required to do in their, in their contract. They sign a contract, and then uh, the, the judge also signs a contract saying if you do certain things, then your cases may be uh, dismissed or you may not be required to go to prison. Each drug court has what we call a drug court team. The team consists of the presiding judge, in the felony drug court, that is myself, in the mental health court just recently I appointed Judge Amanda Messier to be the presiding judge in the mental health court. It was growing so fast and there was just no way that I could keep up with it in all three counties. The district attorney is part of the drug court team or his de designee, the public defender. We have a treatment provider, we have a state probation officer, we have a county probation officer. Sheriff Craig also serves on this team in order to make referrals. Uh, we have uh, different individuals who come to help, help us to select a person to be in the drug court. You will be amazed at the number of referrals that we get from law enforcement officers. And you say, Judge, that's a little strange that we would get, you would get referrals from law enforcement officers they really want everyone to go to prison. You know, that's just not true. Um, one of the things that law enforcement officers understand by going out to the homes of many individuals that they arrest, they look at their environment, some of the people grew up in, and it's uh, amazing that they're doing as well as they do. 
A lot of times in the drug court reviews, judge will ask personal questions, and, and, and as a judge, we get to know these individuals very well. But even, even though I've been in this business since 1996, uh, there's even times when I'm still amazed, but sometimes when I ask questions, the answers I get. Um, one particular evening in talking to some of our new drug court participants, I asked this young man, I said, when did you start using? Six. I thought I misunderstood him. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. He said, six years old. And I said, how did you get drugs when you were six years old? And of course, when he answered, I felt very stupid. He said, well, Judge, my parents were selling drugs. So they would leave them around the house, and I would see the marijuana, and so I would start using They were not really keeping a close eye on me, so that, that's how I started. So in talking to a lot of the individuals, you will find ages of six, nine, lots of times it's middle, it's middle age. I mean, it's middle school age, 13, 11, 12, 13, and certainly a lot uh, in age on up. But I was really amazed by the number of participants in our area that actually started using drugs at age at age six. Uh, you can imagine by the time they got to be in high school and older that it really did become an addiction problem. A little bit about these statistics. I would like for you to take one of these sheets home with you because they're also required to pay a fee of $125 per month to participate in the program. It certainly does not pay the full cost of the program, but it, it uh, is an amount that we use to pay for treatment. We will be one of the circuits, of course, applying for the additional monies that has been provided by the state legislature. It's been signed into law by Governor Deal, and those applications are due in September 21st. Is our plan to try to expand this program. Uh, we're seeking additional um, referrals in this county, in particular from Sheriff Craig. He's very, very supportive of the program. All the sheriffs in all three counties are very supportive of the program. The Mental Health Corp is a little bit of a different um, situation. The individuals in our Mental Health Court um, have suffered from many of these mental illnesses since elementary school. That can be something as simple as criminal trespass, to something as serious as aggravated assault, um, to burglary, uh, to different types of offenses. What we have found, as long as we are able to keep them on their medications and supervise them and do compliance work, then most of the time they will remain stable and they will not be in and out of our local jails. The sheriffs in all three counties are extremely supportive of this program because they felt like they were actually becoming a housing uh, uh, home for a lot of mental health individuals. What we have found is that families have dealt with individuals over the years, and although initially it was a little bit hard for me to understand, uh, they just come into court and say, Judge, we have taken all we can take and no, no ma'am. We will not let them come back home. Well. If I don't have a place to release them to, of course, then I don't like releasing them out to the street because you know what's going to happen. They're going to wander into someone's home. They're going to go into their garage, to, particularly in the, when the weather becomes colder, to find a place to sleep. So what we're trying to do is to work with them as well to find any type of housing that we can find. Once we get them stable, a lot of times the family will allow them to come back home. And, and please do not be too judgmental of the family members initially. I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with someone who had mental, um, mental issues, any problems, but they can be very trying. Uh, I had a couple, an older couple in Fanning County, um, probably in their early 70s, and their son has these issues. They allowed him to come back home, but they sleep in shifts. In other words, they don't sleep at the same time. The mother will sleep for so many hours, the father will sleep for so many hours. As long as their son is on his medication, he is doing well. Well, you say, Judge, why don't you just lock him in jail? He's sick. As long as we can keep him out of jail, and I don't, that may not be a popular thing for me to say, but, but as a Christian, I think that it's a Christian thing for me to say, is that as long as we are able, in this country, we must not take the easy way out, and if you have mental issues and we automatically lock you in jail and throw away the key. That just cannot be something that would be allowed in this country without trying to work through their issues. And these are serious issues. I mean, there are times when 
suicide attempts. Uh, there are times with a couple like in Benning County that I had to send an officer out there. Um, he was in a pond completely nude. He is convinced that he has been, um, that actual uh, probes have been inserted in his brain that he is constantly being watched by the CIA or FBI. He would in fact pass a polygraph. That is how strongly he believes that. To the point where I even thought about actually having someone pretend to be an FBI agent go into his house and telling him that because he's in mental health court, we're going to remove the probes. And I thought, well, that might not be a good idea. But many of these in individuals have these thoughts. Uh, they truly believe those thoughts. And if they're not watched very carefully and monitored, then they can be very dangerous to themselves. And if you are not trained to know how to deal with them, they can be dangerous to others. So everyone working in our mental health court, including law enforcement officers, again, I have to brag on Sheriff Craig, he has been very instrumental in helping to provide the training uh, that people who work with those uh, with mental, mental illnesses needs. Uh, you know, certainly you don't use loud voices, quick actions, those types of things can cause something very mild to be escalated into something very serious. That court now is up, we had a, um, a drug court and a mental health court team meeting yesterday. Uh, that has grown quickly to 81 individuals in our three counties. We are also trying a somewhat pilot project in Pickens County in that Judge Wiginton, uh, our chief magistrate judge, is actually super in, in, supervising individuals on warrants uh, even before they are filed as accusations or indictments to try to very quickly uh, uh, start trying to react to this problem. So this is how that works. The sheriffs or their uh, jail manager or jail officer in each of the three counties, once a person is arrested and they can very quickly realize the individual may be having problems, then they are referred to our mental health court. They are released on a mental health court bond and we start monitoring them day and night. They are monitored much closer uh, than the uh, felt the individuals of the Bell and Drug Court for obvious reasons. We had our first graduation in Fannin a couple of months ago, and that individual decided to come back and is actually helping and mentoring to others in our program to let them know that there is opportunities if they'll just listen, uh, go to the therapist and take their medication to have some type of normal life. Now, a normal life for them is a little bit different uh, than from us. One of the things that's very difficult for me as a presiding judge in the mental health court is this. In family drug court, once they graduate, they have a real opportunity to go back to a normal way of life. They have a job, they have their children back, they are working, they are contributing uh, to their own upkeep and to uh, society in general. So they are very successful. In mental health court, Many of the individuals will never be able to work. They're already drawing disability benefits. And all that we are trying to do is to provide as normal a life for them and their other family members. And frankly, because it's, we're in the criminal justice system, is to keep them out of our local jails, if all possible, and to keep them out of the state prison system. Uh, we are going to work very quickly. Uh, I've been meeting with different groups of veterans in the three counties, and we hope to have our veterans court up and running by uh, October or November. That court will specialize in veterans, and veterans we have found have much different problems. They may have both mental health and addiction issues, so we'll be working with them more closely with a more trained team. What I'd like to do, I uh, may not have any time left, but if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask, I would also like to invite you, our graduations are open to the public. I know some of you have attended, I've looked around the room and some of you filmed them. If you've never been to a uh, drug court graduation, they are called many things, but uh, I think my husband gave it the best name when he said it was like a Baptist revival. Uh, if you've been set through a drug court graduation and not cry, something something's very wrong because you will hear stories of spouses being reunited you will hear stories of parents coming back in and saying thank you for giving me my son back my daughter back 
You will have children, very young to very old, coming back in and saying thank you for giving me my mom and my dad back. So it's a, it's a very good it's a very good program. It saves the state of Georgia, Pickens County, a lot of money, which is extremely important. But it also restores lives, which is extremely important. All right? Any questions? At the bottom of this list, you say total drug-free babies 18. What exactly does that mean? One of the things that, one of the worst things I've ever had to do, I think, was to, um, usually adoptions are the most wonderful things in the entire world, and I love adoptions. But I had the opportunity uh, of residing over an adoption with, what, and I hate to use the term, but it was a meth baby, which had so many problems and would have those problems for the remainder of the child's life. Uh, the child was constantly moving, would probably never walk, so one of the things that's extremely important to us is that uh, if the individuals are pregnant, try to get them into our drug court very quickly so that we can monitor them very quickly so that the, when they give birth to this child, they are, the mother is drug free, the child is healthy and drug free, and again, saves everyone a lot of money, but uh, if you've ever had to watch or see a child that was affected by the use of drugs during the pregnancy. You never want to see more than one. So we very strongly work with the Department of Family and Children's Services, uh, the local jails when they arrest mom, uh, women who they believe to be pregnant. We very quickly intercede to try to make sure that that child and the mother remains drug free throughout the pregnancy. And sometimes we have to do that sometimes by leaving them in jail for a period of time or putting them in a residential placement so that we can ensure that there's no drugs going into that body. So that's what that means. We have monitored and worked through and um, have a part in those babies who are being born drug free and don't have the terrible problems that, that children would have if they're if the mom has used meds or some other drug during pregnancy. Other questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what she has to listen to, see, deal with every day? I'm surprised that you are even pleasant, so. <laughs> Sometimes it's <laughs> I mean, that is a hard thing to do, but there's two sides to that coin. So I believe that you are instrumental in instituting these drug courts and stuff. Is that not that? Yeah, right? Yeah, so that's very good. All right. Charlie, your turn. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, and thank you for everyone that has come. Before I sort of get into what I'm going to try to share with you tonight, I want you to know that before your head hits the pillow or after it hits the pillow, you need to say a prayer of thanks that you have a tough, keen-minded, and kind-hearted Superior Court judge and Judge Weaver. somebody to do for us. Uh, at the end of the day, all those public service jobs are jobs that we're hiring people to do on our behalf. And uh, I worked for a long time uh, Superior Court judge, uh, and I can tell you, it's a tough job. And I appreciate what you do. Um, my home's Dalton, so Judge Partain has been pushing drug court um, in Woodfield and Murray counties for many years, and it works. And uh, if you haven't been to a graduation, uh, you're missing out, and you ought to try that. Uh, I am Charlie Bethel. Uh, I am currently the freshman senator from the 54th Senate District in Georgia, uh, and the district has moved a little bit, and, uh, and so I'm here to visit uh, Pickens County. And Rick Jaspers and I both laid out maps of the, of the new district lines. Uh, you will see that the 54th, as it will be officially constituted come January, uh, includes all of Whitfield and Murray. My, as I said, my home is in Dalton. Um, all of Whitfield and Murray counties, and then the, the eastern part of Gordon County and the western part of Pickens County. Uh, so that's how the 54th looks. Um, uh, I told him it sort of looks like the state of Louisiana, a little bit of a boot. Um, but it's a pleasure to represent uh, the, it, all of Pickens County. I, we're trying to figure out where lines are and who lives where. 
uh, I've done the last two years with a divided Gordon County. Um, you're all my people, and, uh, and I hope you'll consider me uh, your, your voice in the state senate. Steve Gooch represents uh, Pickens County as well. Steve is my friend. Uh, I think he does a great job, uh, and, and we're both freshmen together. We've been learning a lot, so uh, we'll call each other and try to work out issues as they come up. But uh, don't feel like you have to know whether you're in the 54th for me to, uh, me to be responsive to you. Um, it just it doesn't make any sense for me to, to look at it that way. A um, little bit about myself. I grew up in the city of Dalton. Um, I uh, went off to, to school, graduated um, with a business degree from the University of Georgia, stayed there and, and uh, got a law degree as well. I clerked for Charlie Pannell. Judge Weaver knows Judge Pannell. Uh, I clerked for him on the federal court. He's a, he was uh, left the Superior Court bench to, to be on the federal court in Atlanta. I was his law clerk for two years and then moved home to Dalton where I practiced law. Uh, for, for a few years there and uh, tell folks I'm a recovering attorney so you can only hate me a little bit. Uh, but uh, I then went on to work in my family's business, J&J Industries. We are a commercial carpet manufacturer. My grandfather and another gentleman founded that company in 1957. We are still closely held by the families uh, that originally started it and we, uh, we're proud to be in business. Um, I've served on the Dalton City Council and then decided to run for the General Assembly and on the retirement of Dr. Don Thomas, who many of you may know uh, from the Senate, I, I succeeded him uh, two years ago. I am married to Lindsay uh, Bethel, Lindsay, former Lindsay Nix. Uh, she is a pharmacist, uh, but more importantly, she is the mother of my children and uh, she is uh, a great uh, partner uh, in our household talk about family and talk about adoptions. I'll share news. I'm excited. Uh, I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old son, and this week we will file an adoption petition. A uh, little 11-month-old girl uh, is, is needing a family, and we're just tickled to have a little 11-month-old girl added to our boys in our house. So we're, we're very excited at the Bethel House, and, uh, and I'm glad that she's sleeping really well. She came to stay with us uh, before we could get our petition filed. Um, but that, uh, that makes me feel a little less stressed out about driving down to, to Jasper tonight. Um, the, the maps that you see over there are a result of the redistricting process. Um, I, I'll stay out of that tonight. We'll probably have plenty of discussion over the last couple of years. I just want to offer to you uh, that with all the discussion about that process, remember that this is the first time that our state, since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, got all of our maps pre-cleared by the Justice Department on the first try. It's the first time we've done that as a state of Georgia. And keep in mind, that's a Republican-dominated General Assembly governor, and you know our Justice Department is populated by folks who are not particularly friendly. So we feel like we did a good job. Could it have been better? Of course, because uh, we're humans and anything that humans do can be better. Uh, so we have room for improvement there. Um, we talked about the scorecards. I talked with, uh, uh, well, Rick, and Lumpen earlier, Dr. Lumpen earlier, and I said, you know, all these scorecards go out there. I like the ones that individuals do because I always get nervous when people who are trying to lobby you are also grading you uh, because you worry about whether <laughs> whether they want to be your friend until you vote against them. So um, those are good. I, I really appreciate Burke doing doing the uh, scorecard um, that he did, and I think those are good things. I think we all ought to be doing those on our own, on our congressmen, our senators, and our state legislators. I think they're important. Um, Judge Weaver talked about uh, the criminal justice reform and, and the drug courts. Uh, that was certainly an important part. Um, I sit on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, that was an important part of me. You know, Senator Hamrick, who's about to be Judge Hamrick, uh, Superior Court Judge down in Carroll County, led the charge on the Senate side on that initiative. Uh, but on a more personal note, uh, the very first thing I ever pushed uh, uh, was also the very first thing that uh, Rick ever pushed, which was a healthcare compact, um, and we both got into that uh, trying to figure out how to make it work. And because of a lot of hard work, frankly, of Tea Party uh, support and activism, uh, we were able to have a success that made us look good. But it was really the result of the work of, of individuals. And so uh, that's been my experience: is that the most fun parts of the job are when we get to work together as a team with citizens. Um, uh, we're talking about. Uh, told me earlier that Dr. 
learned too much, and, and, and I'm trying not to. Uh, it's been an experience and an education for me. Uh, a couple of thoughts uh, to give you just about myself. Uh, I consider myself a conservative. Um, I believe that the uh, private capital market and the free market uh, is the foundation of what has provided the standard of living we enjoy today. Um, and so I, I, I defend those things. I believe that, that personal liberty and personal accountability are two of the greatest uh, forces for good in this world that have ever been released. And so th those are the, the ways I look at most of the legislation that comes before me uh, for consideration. Um, and before I get too far off on talking about individual topics, uh, I want to give you a, a thought about our state pledge uh, and then I want to do, if there is time, question and answers because uh, I always talk to the school students and I tell them the faster I get the question and answer, the faster it is that at least two people in the room will care about what I'm talking about. Um, so if you, if you get that, I mean, when I'm talking, I don't know if any of you care, uh, but if somebody asks a question, at least you and I care, so we, we'll, we'll get the question and answer. Every day we start our, our session in the state senate, we do say the pledge to the, to the flag of our, our nation. We also say the pledge to the flag of our state. I know one of the things that the Tea Party values is constitutionalism at the federal level. Um, it's a lot harder to read the state constitution, actually, than the federal constitution. Uh, but I have read it, and I read it a, a, I read it a few times. And I'll read it again before we go into session, uh, because we need to know what we're supposed to do there as well. Um, and we, read, we start with the pledge of the flag, and it's a very simple pledge. If you don't know it, it just says, I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag, and to the principles for which it stands. Wisdom, justice, and moderation. That's it. That's our state motto. Wisdom, justice, and moderation. What I pledge to you as a candidate and as your senator um, is that I know I'm not as wise as I should be. But I work hard and I study to try to make up for it. I'm confident I'm not as just as I should be. But I pray hard. And I hope that I have a God that covers up my mistakes. And I'm not as moderate as my wife and my mother would like me to be, but I live in fear that they're going to walk into the room every time I'm acting like a jerk. And so I try to behave in a way that you can be proud of and be uh, think it's respectful of you and also respectful of my duties. And so I try to live that way and I try to represent you that way. And that's who I am as an individual and, and my, my commitment is to do my best to, to honor that. Um, questions, uh, so that we can get two people. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that we're, none of us are perfect. And during your two years, you must have had one vote that you regret. Uh, which one might that be? It's <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Um, if you can't come up with that, just give me the hardest one that you had. Well, I'll ask you with two on that on that question because I'll say this: I, I, I read an interview years ago um, with President Truman, and he sort of got the same question about um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Would, would you do it again? There's no one would you know. And he said, I can't live that way. And, and I'll tell you, it's hard for me to live that way and say, well, what were all the you know what was the worst mistake you ever made? Um, I make so many that it's it's you know it's hard to rank. Um, I will tell you that on a personal level, uh, one of the hardest things was actually a bill I sponsored, and I, I sponsored on the Senate floor, and that was the bill where we had to reduce unemployment benefits in the middle of a terrible recession because of the shortfall. I didn't have a political or philosophical problem with that because as a conservative, I believe you have to balance your budget, you have to pay your bills, you have debts. Unlike our federal government, you can't just keep borrowing. You just can't do it. Um, but I know a lot of people have lost their jobs. And I know what those checks support. And that was very hard for me. So I, I don't mean to say that philosophically it was difficult. Um, as far as just sort of on a policy issue, um, sort of, you might have stumped me there. I, I, for the most part, I felt pretty good when I pushed the button. Um, and I've gone against my leadership, I've gone against my party, I've gone with my party. With my leadership, um, but I, for the most part, I've, I've felt pretty comfortable. I will tell you one that I didn't. <laughs> I mentioned you earlier. I haven't missed a lot of votes. I didn't miss a vote, um, and I probably would have made people mad. Uh, they had a bill. We had a bill. That's the bill of this session, um, and 
I was actually, again, working a, a bill on the House side at the time. And uh, the bill was to require uh, public schools to have at least two staff members uh, educated on uh, caring for uh, children with allergies and, and uh, these sorts of things. And while I think that's really good, I, I just, I mean, I get really weary of the government, the state government. You know, there's a lot of millions of people in Georgia got school boards to decide what's good in schools and what's right. We've got principals to figure out those sorts of things. And I thought it was surely we've got better things to do with our time than to tell educators you have to do one more thing so that involve teaching. Now, do I want those children to be cared for? Of course. But I know what I would do if my fourth grader or second grader had an issue. I'd walk down to Brookwood School, I'd talk to Dr. Martin, and I'd talk to their teacher, and I'd say, my son has this problem. Can I teach you about this? Can I, you know, here's how I, I want you to handle it. Um, and that would happen. And I kind of believe that we live in a country where that is, state at least, maybe I'm, I'm going to exclude California, but uh, <laughs> and at least we live in a state where people can and should still have that level of responsibility uh, for what's going on in their community and their family. I know those aren't really headliners. What other questions? Yes, sir. A um, couple quick parts. One, did you vote to put T. Sploss on the ballot? Two, did you feel good when you pushed that button? And three, the penalty that the counties that did not, the regions that did not vote for it, how do you plan to start working on pre repairing that penalty, the 30% or 300% penalty? So can you answer that? Yes. I, I, did, I promise you all I didn't even ask him to ask that question. Um, I did not vote at all on the T's plus issue because I was on the city council in Baltimore. That, that predates my service in the Senate. Uh, I wrote emails to all of my delegation uh, telling them this was the wrong idea um, and also that it's morally wrong to have blackmailed uh, elected officials and voters through the, through the penalty uh, provision. Uh, so I didn't feel, the second part of your question, I didn't feel it anyway because I didn't push a button. The third part of your question is, I, I have asked legislative council. I'm not alone. Uh, there are other people. I've already asked legislative council for the repeal legislation for the penalty provisions to be drafted. If nobody else drops it, uh, that bill, I will drop it. Um, it, it. To be fair, that's not a slam dunk uh, because there's a lot of other issues in play and everybody's got their own piece of it politically. Um, but I, I feel very strongly that our state government, um, regardless of how you feel about the issue of regional t spots the penalty provisions for not putting it on the ballot and then if you fail to pass it, uh, our, our government shouldn't treat us that way. Um, and so I, that's where I, where I am on that. And um, you know, it doesn't always make all the leadership happy that I say stuff like that. Um, that's what I believe. grow them really well out here in North Georgia. Don't you agree? I mean, these people are fine individuals. Brenda, Charlie, and this one coming up here. <laughs> this one. <laughs> that sounds like I'm at home. <laughs> this one. But, uh, Rick Jasper's I am glad to be here tonight. And um, I said, yeah, I'm one of these ramblers. Y'all heard me speak before, so you know. So I was writing all this stuff down. I'd write it down so I can remember all these things. But I just want to just, um, in the last two and a half years, I've gotten to know Senator Bethel. You know, we did sponsor probably the most constitutional, 10th Amendment positive piece of legislation in two years in the House. It was cool. And we got to do it, and we were freshmen. And maybe it's because everybody else was scared of it and wouldn't do it, and that'll never pass. But like Charlie said, do the Tea Party in Murray and Whitfield County. It passed, and it was ugly, and it was smart, <laughs> but, you know, due to the wisdom of Charlie and the Senate, and my just luck, you know, in the House, we did it with a lot of people's help, and you know, I think we're very fortunate, you know, when these maps came out, that people were upset or divided, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think
think it's going to work out in Higgins County's advantage. You've got two very different people who are sen senators from this area and different perspectives and different thoughts, and it's going to serve us well. And I'm tickled to get to work with both of these gentlemen that's been Gooch and, and Bethel. I'm not really tickled. I look forward to hearing tales about your new daughter. It's going to be fun. I won't move another moment without thanking Marcia. You know, uh, you know, you all know Marcia, she speaks for me when I'm not here. You know, it's my right hand, my anchor, my person that says, are you stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll find somebody to run against you. <laughs> and, and she, we've had these conversations driving down the road. And it's, uh, you can ask her, it's for real. But, you know, it's important, and, you know, uh, I know she prayed a lot during this thing when people were qualifying, but I wouldn't have to go through another three elections in a short amount of time, but I really appreciate Marsha. And I was going to talk about Judge Weaver just a second. It's a whole different way of looking at it. You know, yeah, we spend a billion dollars a year putting people in jail. Billion. That's a lot of money. We're number two, locking people up. And a lot of us got to get them in. I don't like locking them up. They're out of our hair. You know, and I'm just kind of one of those guys and uh, until I've kind of learned and seen what a different side of the courts can do. And, you know, Tea Party is about accountability. You know, holding me accountable, holding Charlie accountable, holding all these elected officials that we look at accountable. Judge Weaver's accountable to you, too. She's got to make sure drug court works, that they don't turn idiots back into the environment to harm us. So there's a little weight on her shoulder of the accountability of being elected, just like we are, to do that. And that's the neat thing about elections. But you know, I just want to take just a little different look at it. But I appreciate the work that Judge Weaver's done with that. I've been to about three graduations, and saw the difference it does make in people's lives. And that's pretty neat. I want to thank you for your support. Two and a half years, you know. Uh, we've all kind of grown up together. That's what I was thinking about, because two and a half years ago, uh, Marcia and Erlene Margo, she's here tonight, it's rain, she's probably it. And another guy and I went to first tea party meeting. I've never been to an LJ, you know, up there at the Sonic Lodge. And we came back and Rod Rucker was hosting us over at Cornerstone Church. That's like the second meeting we've had. And so we've all kind of grown together. I like that because I like the interaction with you guys. You know, whether it be at Annie's today, outside of Annie's, Ingles, outside of Ingles, football games, and bit wherever, y'all aren't afraid. And you're not afraid to challenge us and talk to us and interact with us. And I think that's neat. And that's what a small town is about. But it's also about, uh, hopefully, the accessibility that we are. You know, we're in a battle. And I was writing this today. I was just thinking about the world. And we are in a battle for our country and what it's going to be 20 years from now. I was watching some of the um, convention like y'all were. We have to be proactive. And I was thinking about this as, you know, we got the little pen that we talked about tonight. Is, you know, we need to practice on each other. Convincing each other that what we think is right. Because you're going to run into a whole bunch of people that I run into every day that think we're wrong. But we're going to have to really work on it. Begin to vote not just in Georgia, but when we practice talking to one another here, we're going to have to get online. We're going to have to get on Facebook. We're going to have to get on the telephone. Because there's about six states. And if I made every pay of people hold up their hands, I'm looking across the room right now, I think there's about three people in here that were born in Pickett's County. That's it. Okay, the rest of y'all are somewhere else, just like me. I'm from Tennessee. They marched group in Florida for a little while. You're going to have to take get outside that little comfort zone talking to people that we normally talk to and call somebody in Virginia that you know. Wisconsin, North Carolina, all these states, you see my passion come out. Because <clears throat> we've got to do it. These states that are on the edge, your passion by calling somebody and saying, hey, this is important. Think about voting my way. Will it change the election? And I think that's one of those neat things I think that it might. Because it's going to be important. And you know, so I ramble around, I need your help. That's enough on that one. I need your prayers for our family. We need your prayers for our state. Charlie and I are down there. We're 
looking down the barrel of leadership, saying, you better put it this way. And to answer Bert's question, he's going to answer me in a minute. I can answer that question because I remember that one of the leadership of the House turned around to me on the House Court and says, you better put it with us. And I pushed a big red no. You know, they didn't talk to me for three days now, until they needed something else. But <laughs> it's true. But you've got to have that will to know that when you're here, when you cross that Pickens County line, you're back at home. Where you can be strong and you know people are going to support you. I got a handout I hope you take a look at that tells about what we did. I mailed it out to everybody. I hope you got one. I hope you just didn't look at it. You know, I read Jasper's book of trash. But take a look at it because it's got my cell phone number on it. So I do have it over there. We hope you'll use it to call us if you need us. My email address, all that contact information. It talks about some of the things we did in the legislature this year that I'm proud of. And, I, and, and I'll talk about them in a minute. But yeah, there's some things, Bert, we, we did with that past that we weren't proud of. I'm not. And, and they bother you. But in most of the bills that we passed in there aren't perfect. And people are just horrified to know that. But when you think about it realistically for a minute, it's people like you and me that are doing these things. So they're not all perfect. That's why we meet again to kind of twist them or make them better as we see that mistakes have been made. That's what we have to do. But one thing I'm real, I'm tickled about our budget, what we worked on. I was at a meeting on Saturday. They talked about the budget this upcoming year. When they got through talking, you could hear your heart beating in the room. Obamacare is going to kill us all in their budgets and their states. It's going to $360 million will be in our budget. We don't have it. It's got to come out of somebody's hide somewhere because we're certainly not going to raise taxes because we haven't done that and we won't. And Georgia's legislature is committed to living within their means just like we're supposed to. And it's time. And it, you know, these budget discussions that go on, it's gut wrenching. Today and that all day on education, they did. I'm not on that committee, so I wasn't there. But so this thing works all year long. The budget is the biggest thing we do, and I'm proud of what we've done the last year of that. Things you'll see in that little handout, zero-based budgeting. It's going to be a neat thing to see at work. I don't know how much money it's going to save. There's all this speculation. It's billions, and some people say it won't save much. But it's really making the part of education who's under it right now look at their programs and justify what they're doing. One of the bills that was passed last year was a Government Accountability Act, and what that did was going to let us, people like me and Charlie, be on the committee, and be able to look at a department and the programs within it and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do and run on track. Now the governor saw that was an invasion of the executive office and vetoed that one. We'll come back to that, I'm sure, next year to let us look at it. You know, because these things get started and go on and on and don't stop. And that's where we need to be there. Uh, other things, drug testing. Senator Gooch talked about them last year. They're just great. Uh, our tax reform thing was super. But I kind of want to just talk about the Tea Party influence real quick. Because like Charlie said, the healthcare compact was yours. I mean, it really was a, a neat thing. But those state people, from the Tea Party of those two counties came to the legislature 31 days out of 40 to make it go. And they had to really get up with because no way did it work. Last year, they attacked partisan elections, that same group that they didn't get very far with that, but they tried. And it was really neat to see them around there every day working. Oh, Charlie lets them use the, his office, I let them use mine, and they're camping out down there. The health care exchange was stopped by Tea Party folks in 2011. That's on hold right now to wait to see what happens in November. Because we can't let the federal government run a health care exchange in Georgia. We need to do our own. But right now it's there. Gun laws, tax bill, it was, it was going. It was the hardest, it was going to be the hardest vote any of us had to take in 2011. But due to some Tea Party folks really questioning the legitimacy of the numbers that were being used, it stopped it. And then it came back and we passed a great tax bill this past year. You know, you know about T-SPLOS and what's happened with that. So you've had influence. 
in, especially in the state house. I don't know about locally, but I'm going to give you something to work on in just a minute. Because Agenda 21 is out there. And you're going to see it how it's infiltrating it. Two years ago, no one in this room knew what it was. I didn't. had no clue. A year and a half ago, we started figuring it out, hearing about it. Now we're all kind of up to snuff on it. And, and how treaties that are signed by Hillary Clinton and the Secretary of State are being enforced on us as law that we have to work on. That's one reason when you talk to somebody in Virginia, why should you vote for a different party than Obama? That's one you can really talk about. But lastly, you know, on this Agenda 21 thing, so I've got all these people that send me this stuff. So would you believe that, that the, there's a state agency in the state of Georgia that wants to um, enact martial law in Georgia? And you know what that means? That means they can come into your house. They can take whatever they want to and redistribute it. You think if somebody wants to do that? Well, there are kids. And it's an ordinance that's being passed around by Homeland Security right this minute. And um, GEMA and found out about it through Fannin County. And Fannin County had an uproar last this very week over this thing. And Commissioner Simons killed it because it was going to do that. And uh, this gentleman who lives here in Pickens County is looking at our thing to see how to, we've passed this thing already. And the other counties, you're going to see that grow. It's going to be something you really need to look at and hold our commissioner and commissioners accountable for it. So I think it's something none of us would stand for and we don't want to see. But as this Agenda 21 moves on, where you're going to see the most impact is at these local government levels, these little, little things that state agencies want to push in here just to make it work better. Um, and that's just one of them. But we I commend Commissioner Simons up in the band for really whacking it back just, just, just in the last day or two. You know, the future, it's going to be, you know, like I said, the budget's tough. Uh, I haven't talked to Senator Bethel, but I don't think that our legislature is inclined in this world where today to fund the Falcons of the ball state. I mean, I can't believe or I'm thinking that we'll do that. You know, we're going to continue tax reform. The transportation is going to be looked at. The favor of floss. There's going to be a lot done on that. We're going to have to really look at, now that Charlie and I are there, and all the lot of other people, conservative, more conservative group was there in 2010. How are we going to do it a little bit differently? Uh, there's one interesting one. There's an old dog in the um, House of Representatives that's learned a new trick. That's the way it was described to me the other day. You'll see a bill in the House of Representatives that will have zero uh, gifts from lobbyists to state representatives and senators. Now that's going to have to be worked on because we don't want it to make sure if you come to the Capitol and we'll take a quick peek at the varsity hot dog, which you can't do that, or as a community. But I think you'll see a big discussion on no gifts from lobbyists to legislators this coming session. Education funding, redoing it's big, it's going on right now. Uh, I'm working on a bill right now on uninsured drivers and how we're going to try to hold that back and also working on. SNAP, that's food stamps. You know, food stamps are a federal program. We can't really undo all of it it's because the president, that's, that's his thing. We can kind of tweak it where they can spend it. And they don't need to spend it in liquor stores. And I want to echo Senator Gooch. He made a really good point. And I watched, if you don't, if you want to catch up on this, you can go to No Pickens. That's what I did today. And Mary's here taping this. And I went and looked at what Senator Gooch had to say. Spending control, how we spend money, is going to be difficult. That's going to be the hardest challenge we're up against. As you look and see what happened eight years ago, we had Republican control of the Senate, Congress, and the President. They spent like drunken soldiers. The House of Representatives in Georgia, the Senate, the Republican governors spent like crazy during those big economic times. How are we going to set up a method? not doing that when times get better. And some needs we need met because there are people out there who absolutely say right today, we need to raise taxes to, to fund lots of programs, something called Georgia 2020, if you want to get your blood pressure up. But um, and one neat thing that, I, that uh, my son told me that they had watched Huckabee, he's in a 
house with six guys that are watching up me on Sunday night. That's pretty neat. <laughs> but uh, it kind of amazed me. But he said, one thing, he says, one thing you've got to learn. He said, talk to young people. You've got to find out for yourself. You've got to question. And you know, that's what I think is neat with the Tea Party because it relates to somebody like me. Is, you know, when I'm voting on something, I'm thinking about Bert Law. Now, how am I going to explain this vote to him? Or Kathy? Any of who might call me. And, you know, what am I basing it on? I'm really easy to get a hold of. You know, drop, you know, I've got phone numbers in the book. Got that little red thing over there. Got a great website, easy to get a hold of. Uh, please call me. I've got other things in mind that we'll be doing, but, you know, we want to listen. We'll call you back and we'll follow through. That's been uh, about my work for the third years, and, uh, and I'll continue doing that. But I think I will, I'll hang around. So that's the question. So I'll hang around because we want to keep moving that one. Okay, yes. Thank you.
my OCD sometimes gets the better of me, and uh, and I tend to think that everybody should be should be as obsessed with Agenda 21 as I am. Well, unfortunately, that's not always the case. But uh, in mentioning Agenda 21 to friends and family, I frequently get asked, well, why are you so concerned about Agenda 21 with all this other stuff that's going on? And you might have that same thought running through your mind, and uh, right now, for, a man, for that matter, and so let's, let's think about it. Why should you be concerned about Agenda 21? <coughs> After you've gotten to see the video this evening, it'll be clearer to you why you should be concerned. But let me just suggest several reasons. Agenda 21 is a progressive Marxist plan for a global central government. The ideology states that the collective is more important than the individual, and that the global governance is the key. This global plan is being implemented locally by unelected boards and officials. Our city and county planning boards are being trained to redevelopment agency standards to further the vision of remaking American cities with your money, your property taxes. Back in mid-1990s, uh, Clinton gave the American Planning Association a grant to write a planning guide, and it's got a real long title, uh, and that's not all that important right now, but uh, since 2002, it's being used to train planners in every college, university, and government planning office in the nation. Full implementation of Agenda 21, and of course this is the agenda for the 21st century is what it actually means, will take 35 to 40 years, and that means 2050, maybe, it would all be fully Im implemented. But the groundwork is rapidly being laid across the country right now. The Tea Party on a national basis has been instrumental in exposing Agenda 21, and proponents know that resistance is building. And we need to nip it in the bud and defeat it now. Our individual freedoms are being eroded rapidly, and it's like death by a thousand cuts. Our children and grandchildren are being brainwashed our educational system, and it only takes one generation to really accomplish a lot of brainwashing. Uh, the handouts that Bob has just uh, given you are uh, both Agenda 21 sustainability uh, oriented. There's some great information in the, both of those. They're actually the creation of Rosa Corey, who you're going to see in the video here in just a few minutes, and she is is dynamite. So take those handouts with you. There's no copyright on them. You can duplicate them, spread around, spread them around, and uh, make the best use that you can of them. A uh, few words on the goals of the UN Agenda 21 before we get into the video. One goal is creation of global governance. It's really a new world order of the fourth degree, I guess you could call it. NWO is the term that you see frequently for New World Order. Uh, another goal is to inventory and control all aspects of our lives. Another goal is to redistribute wealth, which how many times have we heard that? Bring the U.S. economy down and level the global playing field. Another goal is regionalization. Blur the county lines, blur the state lines, or the country lines uh, in the United States, they'll plan to create nine or ten mega regions within the within the boundaries of the United States, and those, of course, would be the major urban areas, which would be connected by what else but high-speed rail. Uh, incidentally, uh, T-SPLOS fits very nicely into the Agenda 21 scheme of things. It blurred the line, blurred the county lines of the state. Another goal, elimination of the middle class. Gradually take away all individual rights for the benefit of the collective. You can look at Red China and see how, how well that works. Although they may be turning the corner a little bit as, as far as uh, increasing the middle class. 
Uh, and last but not least is population reduction and control. And we're talking major population reduction. So the question is, how do they plan to accomplish that? Uh, everything's being done in the name of the environment. It's radical environmentalism. Everything is geared to save the earth and not the individual. A couple popular terms and buzzwords that uh, we need to, to uh, be aware of, and, and you'll, you'll hear them over and over again once you start to recognize them. Sustainable development, sustainable community, sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. Social justice and social equity. Smart growth. That's the plan of redevelopment for the urban areas, the smart growth. Uh, within the urban areas, you've got terms like high-density urban mixed-use development. Walkable, bikeable, green, everything that sounds warm and fuzzy and wonderful. And there's, there's really nothing wrong with, with uh, that, those concepts in the general sense. Urban growth boundaries. It's a concept of drawing a boundary around the metropolitan areas and saying, okay, you, you cannot build anything new outside these boundaries. If you do, we're make, going to make it very, very expensive for you to live there and very expensive for you to drive. So you're going to eventually be forced to come inside the boundary. And of course, uh, that feeds right into the stack and pack concept, which you may have heard too, which is typical of uh, all areas of Russia and China where you have these huge high-rise buildings where the people are literally stacked in there in these very, very small living accommodations. Wildlands projects, another prominent term, and that's the plan for the rural or the suburban areas. Italy, International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives. It's a mouthful. Uh, and they tend to change these terms periodically, so you may not see that term used much in the, in the literature. But uh, those folks are tasked with carrying out Agenda 21 goals. NGOs, uh, I'm sorry, not national, but non-governmental organizations. Examples, Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club, National Audubon Society, American Planning Association, and ICLEI, and on and on. Public-private partnerships. These are the favored contractors of the future. These will be the folks that will build whatever gets built in this, uh, in this socialist utopia. You'll need to check on your county planning organizations. Look for the comprehensive long-range plan. It's usually a 10-year plan. I think Pickens County just updated theirs mid-term here last year. All right, now I think it's about time to uh, get us into the video. Uh, Rosa Corey is a liberal Democrat, if you can imagine that, from the San Francisco Bay Area. She speaks nationally, raising awareness of the dangers of UN Agenda 21. Uh, this apparently is not a partisan issue in the true sense. Uh, a lot of the information that I've given you tonight and that, that she will give you is available on a website called Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. And it's, it's unbelievable the amount of information that that contains and lots of, of YouTube videos with Rosa, uh, Corey, and, and uh, other folks. As Rosa states, Agenda 21 is not conspiracy theory, it's conspiracy fact. So I'm anxious for you to see this. Uh, so we'll get going here, Lori, whenever you're ready. And uh, I want to... Before we go into questions, uh, cover just a few more things here. I've got tons of information uh, with me if anybody cares to, to dig into it. Uh, website references, I've got a long list here. The easiest way to get at the subject generally is just Google 
UN Agenda 21, and you'll get an infinite number of sites. Uh, interestingly, the John Birch Society has a great website, and they are fighting desperately to defeat Agenda 21. And I think that's about all I've got to say here, except to just, uh, before we get into the questions, let's talk for a minute about what you can do to help defeat Agenda 21. Kind of goes without saying that contact your friends, relatives, especially those who are out of state or in any of the swing states, educate them and enlist their help. Copy these handouts, use them, uh, study them, make sure you, you go beyond them. Put your congressmen and senators on speed dial. Put Rick Jaspers on speed dial. That's, that's, <laughs> since he's given out his cell phone, that, that's an interesting one. Uh, call them off and tell them to do the right thing and stop socialism. I've got Isaacson and Shambles' number here if you don't happen to have them. Keep your eyes open, pay attention. Get involved locally. Get to know your local commissioners, your school board members, your planning officials. Watch for the term sustainability used in ads, websites, and question it when you see it. Help kick Ickley out of your city, your county, and your state. Help get the UN out of the US. And first and foremost, help get the US out of the UN. In closing, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Keep the faith and remember that we conservatives are in the minority, in the majority, uh, as opposed to what the left would, would like us to think. I'll leave you with this quote from Sir Edmund Burke, 1781. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Do we have some time for questions again? Maybe one or two, but I have one. All right. Is that, is that this, one of the two? Yeah, yeah one of the two. <laughs> These gas prices are staying up because they want us to move closer. <laughs> I'm serious. I really think that's the, that it is controlled and because um, they don't seem to go down at all. And I just think that people are going to think I've got to move closer to work because that's their goal. Well, I, I agree with you 100% that, uh, that the goal is to, to make automobiles so expensive to own and operate that we'll all be forced to move into the inner city, ride bicycles, ride rapid transit, and ride bolt trains, I guess, high speed rail. Anybody else? Sir? Do you happen to know if the Chinese or pick the county? Has this book, and if they're doing anything, I don't. We find that out. We've talked to Rob Jones briefly, probably what a month or two ago, Bob, and we really didn't pursue it with him. But we do need to follow up on that because uh, if if what Rosa says is true, then they're being fed information. They're being fed these planning guides. Just like everybody else is. Now, California is way ahead of the pack, I think, in in moving toward Agenda 21. But but you've got a very good point. We need to we need to follow up on this. Follow up on that. How about our planning or zoning guys? Yeah, we need to we need to get to Rob and find out who's who the parties are and, and, and get to them. Yes. Yes, sir. Quick comment. Uh, Something that Mr. Jasper said earlier about Commissioner Simons in Fannin County and the Marshall Law thing. I respect Commissioner Simons, but let's keep in mind, one of the reasons that did not pass is you could not get another citizen in the room that night. Okay, I, I respect Mr. Simons. I know him. I was there that night. You couldn't get another citizen in the room. Your, your, your elected officials, for the most part, in this region are very conservative, good people. But they're getting things from GEMA. They're getting things under the guise of emergency management that truly no disrespect to them. They don't understand. And then they're told they don't get grants in the future. 
Mr. Simon's would have passed that the other night. No disrespect to him if the room wasn't full. You have this stuff happening on the local level, and that's how they're getting in. And under the guise of scaring you that if there's a national emergency, they need your property and things like that. So I mean to interrupt you, but on the local <coughs> level, you have to fill the rooms that these commissioners meet. Right. Anybody else? There's there's so much conversation that can be had on this subject that it's it's incredible. And uh, Bob and I have been reading and studying and doing all sorts of everything we can do to, to try to keep up with it. And as we go from month to month with the Tea Party meetings, it's always a challenge to figure out whether you can use something that you found a month ago, or is there a ton of new stuff out there? And, and the way it's been developing, it's, it's just a constant, constant motion. So uh, we, we really do need to, to nip it in the bud. And uh, if we don't, it, it's going to be too late. So hopefully, uh, November 6th is uh, going to allow us to make some steps forward in, uh, in uh, trying to make this happen and, and defeat this particular plan. Yeah, I've got uh, more of a statement than a question. Uh, National Geographic says that uh, only 20% of the people in the world own acreage. Only 20%. 70% of the people in the world live in cities. And 2% of our population is involved in agriculture. 2%. Great compliment, great compliment to the job of gun agriculture, but also it shows you how small that group is that is in agriculture. Also, I just want to make a statement that it shows you how, what a minority we, the United States, are, being that most countries don't allow ownership of acreage. If you want to buy a piece of property in Venezuela, they'll lease it to you, but they will not sell it to you. You cannot own that that uh, deed. So the United States is in a real minority position as far as the UN is concerned because the globe is different than we are. We all know that. Uh, one other thought crossed my mind here. Uh, Bob had mentioned to me that we ought to say something about the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, which you may have heard mentioned. Uh, it, it took place June 20th, 22nd, roughly this past June, in Rio, in Brazil. And it is billed as the Rio Plus 20 because it's 20 years after George H.W. Bush committed the United States to Agenda 21 in 1992. And so every year they've gone forward and each president has, has promoted this and pushed it forward. And, uh, lost it, I guess, but anyway, you can probably hear me without that. Uh, there's, there's very little mention of this in the media. You had to be aware of it and, and search for it. Uh, as it turns out, Obama, Merkel, and Cameron did not attend. Hillary Clinton did. All, all countries agreed to renew their commitment to sustainable development. Roughly 190 Nations attended. Uh, the numbers I saw said 45,000 people in attendance. Now that, that sounds incredible. But they went on for 10 days. And uh, they didn't get quite the results they had hoped for. But uh, bottom line was that the nations in attendance uh, pledged $513 billion to promote the furtherance of Agenda 21. And Hillary pledged the United States to a huge amount of money. I, I've got a figure here, 360 billion. I, that sounds a little bit outrageous, but uh, it, it's certainly possible. But uh, anyway, well, I appreciate your time and attention tonight. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, anything you want to discuss up here, I think we'll probably wrap up. And I'll turn it back over to you, Kevin. This is excellent.
years ago because of the people rising up and finding out these things and informing you and you because it's hard for you to get down there and all of a sudden they have all these bills come at you and unless you know what's going on and we're learning all this so this is excellent and I'm very encouraged by it and we can stop it and I believe the United States is in the way of this global environment. The United States is standing in the way and um, it's because there's a different breed of people living in the United States so let's hope we all stick together on that. Next month we'll have Dick Tash, we'll talk about uh, senators and Bert Laughlin will give us an idea of what we need to do to support conservative candidates. Let's take back the Senate. And I think that's doable. So we'll, we'll see about that next month. But otherwise, I think we're done. And this has been a great informational time. Thank you to all the candidates.